Although there may be signs of spring outside, it is still winter and the best way to cope with a really grey day is to lock yourself away in the kitchen and do some home baking. Well, we're going to start off with a recipe for fresh lemon curd cake and I think this is one of the greatest cakes and the good news is it happens to be one of the easiest. It's made by the all-in-one method and I'll explain that as we go along. First of all, you need six ounces of self-raising flour and that must be sifted to give it an airing and I've done the sifting. Then, this is an easy cake made by the all-in-one method so what we're going to do is add a bit of extra baking powder, even though it's self-raising. One level teaspoon of baking powder will give it a little bit of help in the rising. Then we've got six ounces of butter here, and the butter must be very, very soft, room temperature. So if it's a cold day, or if the weather's cold, take it out of the fridge the night before so it's as soft as this. So in goes the butter, six ounces. And then we're going to use three large size one eggs. One, two, three. And one thing you can remember is when you're making uh, layer cakes like this, sometimes called sponge cakes, sometimes called sandwich cakes, um, if you're using three eggs, everything else is six ounces. So six ounces of caster sugar next, six ounces of butter, six ounces of flour. And then I'm going to use, because it's a lemon cake, a tablespoon of lemon juice and the zest of a whole lemon, a large lemon. So that goes in next. And all you do now is you take an electric hand whisk. You can use a wooden spoon and a little bit more elbow grease, but it's easier if you do it like this. And just whisk all that together. Now you'll see why you need to have the butter really, really soft. And this method, the all-in-one method, is the easiest type of method to use. Sometimes, making a classic Victoria sponge cake, I'll just switch that on a bit higher. Sometimes if you're making a classic Victoria sponge cake, you cream the butter and the sugar together first, and then you add the egg little by little. And sometimes it curdles and it it's a bit difficult for beginners, but for beginners, this one, I would say, is foolproof. Now, when you finish mixing it, what you should have then is a mixture that will, if you take a spoon and just pick it up like that and go like that on the edge of the uh, bowl, the mixture will just drop off quite easily and that's the way to tell. Now if it doesn't drop you can add a spot more liquid, in this case it could be lemon juice or it could be milk. Now the next important thing are the cake tins. And what we're going to do is divide the mixture between these two cake tins here and while we're doing that I'm going to explain to you how important it is to have the right size cake tin. And If you've ever made a cake and it's failed I get a lot of letters from people who do that, make cakes and they fail. And usually the reason is because the cake tins are not the right size. So when you're making a cake, when you're making this cake, you need to have two seven inch sandwich tins. And that is um, 18 inches, uh, 18 centimeters, sorry, seven inches, 18 centimeters. And you can also make this mixture in um, an 8-inch tin, which is 20 centimetres. But the reason I'm putting it in the smaller tin, the 7-inch tin, is because we're going to split the cakes horizontally afterwards. Now, just smooth it over, and you'll see also, I didn't mention, that what we've got at the bottom here is the base of the tin, just the base of the tin lined with um, silicone paper, sometimes called baking parchment because that will stop it sticking and it's easier to turn out. So just smooth it over like that. And these go into an oven preheated to gas mark 3 or the equivalent. And they'll take about 35 minutes to cook and become soft and springy to touch in the centre. And then the next thing you do is you turn them out onto a wire cooling tray 
and you peel off the base paper. And the way to peel the paper off is to just get the end and pull it directly back like that and then it comes off quite easily instead of trying to sort of lift it off. Now what we're going to do is take one of the cakes and slice it horizontally because what we're going to do is make this into a layer cake with layers of lemon curd. So to get the layers it has to be sliced horizontally and you need a good sharp knife to do this. A good sharp bread knife will do or this is perfect because it's a palette knife with a serrated edge. This is a, a gem of a knife, this one. So what you should be doing now is sitting down on a chair and looking at this eye level but I haven't got a chair here so I'm just going to see if I can get the knife through fairly evenly. There we go. And you can just have a look inside and see how nice this all-in-one cake is and very easy to make. We'll slice the other one in two later on, but now we're going to need something to sandwich the cake together with, and this is going to be classic homemade lemon curd. You start off with about an inch of water in a saucepan like this, and then you fit a bowl over the water, and in the bowl you can see here I've got the juice and the grated zest of a large juicy lemon and three ounces of caster sugar. And the first thing I'm going to do is just blend those together over this pan of water and let them get quite warm. And as soon as they're warm, I'm going to add some butter. And while I'm waiting for it to warm, I'm going to also tell you that the large juicy lemon I'm using is one of these over here, which is a large unwaxed lemon. And that seems to provide enough zest and enough juice to make a lovely sharp lemon curd. As that's warming through, I'm going to add two large eggs. And these are size one eggs. And then I'm just going to whisk the eggs into the lemon and just wait now for that to become nice and warm. And just test that with your finger and you can see it's, it's warmed up a little bit now. And then you add two ounces of butter and this is unsalted butter and it's been just cut up into little cubes so that I can beat the cubes into the rest of the mixture quite slowly. It actually takes altogether about 20 minutes to make lemon curd. And you have to be prepared not to stay with it for the whole 20 minutes, but to stand nearby and just come up and give it a little whisk. Because what will happen is all that will blend together and that gentle heat underneath will gradually thicken it. It's rather like making a custard really, a real custard. And in 20 minutes time it will become the right consistency. And 20 minutes later you have your beautifully thickened, wonderfully fresh lemony tasting lemon curd and then all you do is remove it from the heat and allow it to cool and then you use it to sandwich the cake together. And we've got one here. You can see the four layers and the lemon curd in between. And for the finishing touches, we're just going to add a little bit of icing, lemon icing, on the top there. And this is actually just two ounces of icing sugar. And to get it to this consistency, you need about one and a half teaspoons of lemon juice. And what we're going to do is put that now onto the top of the cake and then just spread it out very, very thinly. Don't worry if some of it falls down the sides of the cake because that can look quite nice. But all we want is that just that lovely sort of glacé topping which will just give the final lemon flavour to it. And then when you've got the icing all over it, that'll probably drip down a little bit later, the final touch, the finishing touch is this which is grated lemon zest, which has been actually done with a, with a proper lemon zester, so you get nice little curly bits like that, which makes it look pretty.
And I would say that is probably the nicest lemon cake in the whole world. I hope you agree. Now we're going to move from lemons to chocolate and have a look at chocolate brownies. First of all, break two size one eggs into a bowl and beat them together. Then add two ounces of chocolate and four ounces of butter that have been melted together over hot water. Sift in two ounces of plain flour next. Then add a level teaspoon of baking powder and a quarter of a teaspoon of salt. Next add eight ounces of granulated sugar beat the mixture again. And now the nuts, one ounce each of macadamia, brazil, pecan and hazelnuts. And these have been toasted in the oven for six minutes at gas mark four. Now pour the mixture into a baking tin and this measures seven inches by seven inches. Then shake the mixture to level it out. Bake for 30 minutes at gas mark four then leave to cool before cutting into squares. You should get 15 squidgy chocolate nut brownies all together. Well, if you've never done any home baking before, I think probably the best thing to start off with is a batch of homemade scones, because they're easy and they're quick. And I'm going to show you two kinds of scones today, a savoury and a sweet. And we're going to start with the sweet version, this is called rich fruit scones, and in my basin here, my, my mixing bowl, I've got eight ounces of self-raising flour and three ounces of butter, and the butter's at room temperature. And the first thing I'm going to do is begin to rub the butter into the flour. Now, once that resembles a fairly even-looking mixture, you then add some sugar, and the sugar I'm going to use is caster sugar, and this is one and a half ounces of caster sugar. So that's going to go in next. And I'm just going to mix that with my knife into the rest of the ingredients. And I'm going to add just a pinch of salt. And here, I've got two ounces of mixed dried fruit. And if I could explain mixed dried fruit, it's actually raisins, currants, sultanas, and little bits of candied peel, which give a nice flavour. So that's going to go in next. And now the liquid I'm going to use is, first of all, a beaten egg. So that'll go in next. And start to mix the liquid with a knife. And then with the egg, I'm also going to use another ingredient, and that is... This here, which is buttermilk, and you can buy buttermilk in cartons from the dairy counter in the um, supermarket. And I might need two tablespoons, I might need three. So you never know when you're using flour just how much it's going to absorb. So start off with two, and then if you need another one, add another one. Now, if you can't get buttermilk, don't worry, you can just use ordinary milk, I think probably whole milk would be the best. And I think that does look a little bit dry, so I'm going to go for another half a tablespoon of buttermilk. And then keep going with the knife and then finally finish off with your hands. There we are. And what we should have at the end is a, is a nice moist mixture that comes together and leaves the bowl clean. Now the next thing we're going to do is roll out the dough and cut the scones. But before I do that, I just want to show you this lovely new savoury version of scones. Savoury scones are wonderful, served warm from the oven, perhaps with a salad for a light lunch. And the savoury scones I'm going to make today are with feta cheese and sun-dried tomatoes and olives. Don't forget the olives. And what I've started off in here is I've got two ounces of whole wheat flour and six ounces of self-raising flour. And I've also got a, a quarter of a teaspoon of baking powder. 
And it's quite nice having the bit of nutty um, whole wheat flour in this. And if I could point out any of the pitfalls to you at scone making, it's make sure you've got self-raising flour all the time. I have done it once with plain flour because I didn't look at the packet properly. And what you end up with is sort of nasty, tough little pancakes. Now, this is going to have all sorts of gorgeous ingredients added to it now. First of all, two ounces of chopped, sun-dried tomatoes. They've been preserved in oil. And then I've got ten pitted olives. The stones have been taken out and I've chopped them. Then over here, I've got a quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper and a quarter of a teaspoon of mustard. And here, I've got some feta cheese, three ounces of Greek feta cheese. And this has been cut into little tiny cubes. And this here is one and a half teaspoons of fresh chopped thyme leaves. So they'll go in next. And the feta cheese is quite salty, so you don't need any salt in these. Just turn the ingredients round in the flour. And then the liquid is quite different this time. First of all, it's two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. So one tablespoon first, and we'll just sprinkle that over, just lightly all over, and then another tablespoon. And then we're going to add some more oil as well. And that is the oil that the sun-dried tomatoes have been preserved in, one tablespoon of that sun-dried tomato oil. Now we'll go back to the knife and give that a light mixing. But that won't be enough moisture to bind the dough. So what I'm going to do is add what's in my bowl in front of me here, and that is a beaten egg that's been beaten with two tablespoons of milk. And I'm going to add about half of that, because I'm not quite sure, again, just quite how much I'll need to make this into a dough. I think that's just about it now, so what I'll do is now go in with my hands, but be quite gentle because there's a lot of ingredients here and the cheese needs to stay in nice little clumps because then what happens is those little clumps of cheese melt in the cooking and it's just wonderful when you come to eat it. So you carry on, the principles are the same. If you don't get all those crumbs into the dough, then you add a bit more liquid. I think we're going to do that now, just a tiny bit more, just a fraction, and then we'll be there. And the next thing then for me to show you is how to roll the dough out. But I'm going to leave that one and roll out the sweet version for you. Now, this needs to go onto a a lightly floured board, like that, and then I'm just going to shape it into a round and tell you there are two secrets to making scones. Well, they're not secrets, really, but two things, two points that you mustn't forget. One is, as I've already said, use self-raising flour, and the other is when you roll them out, this is where I think most people go wrong, is when you roll them out, don't roll them out too thinly. You see, you, that's all you need to do. You just need to roll it out like that, just to about an inch thick. And then you place the cutter. This is a two-inch fluted cutter, lightly on the top. And then you give it a sharp tap like that. That's it. Out it comes. And then just flour it lightly on top and place it on a greased baking sheet. I'm just going to do one more. When you're cutting things out, you mustn't go like that. It's very tempting to twist it, but you don't. You just put it on top like that and then give it a sharp tap with your hand like that. And there's your little scone. We'll give it a dusting of flour. The next thing they need is a really hot oven, gas mark seven or the equivalent, and they'll take about 12 to 15 minutes to cook. Right, now I'm going to show you the savoury scones as they look when they've finished baking. And what I didn't tell you before is when you've cut them out, you then sprinkle them with another two ounces of feta cheese, and that melts down and gives a lovely crust to the scones when you eat them. And now I'd just like to show you what the scones look like inside texture-wise. 
These, the fruit scones made with buttermilk, I'll just split one open like that, um, are probably the lightest scones in the world. They just melt in the mouth. And what that would need, I think, is a nice bit of clotted cream and some homemade jam. Perfect. And then these over here, I think, are best served with butter. Let me just show you one of these opened out with all those lovely ingredients in them. And I think they're best served not hot from the oven, but still slightly warm. And in any case, you must always eat scones the day you bake them. They freeze quite well, but they don't keep. They don't store well. Right, that's scones. Now we're going to make a rather unusual cake. This is an Italian polenta and ricotta cake. You start with seven ounces of polenta and Italian maize flour, and you sift it together with seven ounces of self-raising flour, one heaped teaspoon of baking powder, and one heaped teaspoon of cinnamon. There will be some grains from the polenta flour left, so tip them in as well. Now add eight ounces of caster sugar, nine ounces of ricotta cheese, four ounces of melted butter, and seven ounces of tepid water. Now go in with an electric hand whisk and whisk everything till smooth. Lastly, fold in six ounces of chopped dates that have been soaked in three tablespoons of amaretto liqueur and two ounces of chopped toasted pecan nuts. Now spoon the mixture into an 8-inch cake tin and sprinkle some demerara sugar over the surface before baking at gas mark 3 for 1 and 3 quarters to 2 hours. Here it is, polenta and ricotta cake. It has a lovely crunchy surface, but when you open it inside, you find a lovely sandy moist texture with the flavour of amaretto, dates and pecans. Well, this is yet another cake, and this one is a very easy, another all-in-one cake. And I started off in my bowl here with all the ingredients in together. Four ounces of whole wheat flour, four ounces of plain, one and a half teaspoons of baking powder, a pinch of salt, four ounces of butter, two eggs, and six ounces of soft brown sugar. And this has been all beaten together with four tablespoons of milk, so that what I've got um, now, what I should have, yes, is a, a good dropping consistency. But what is the name of the cake? The name of the cake is Quick Apricot and Pecan Loaf Cake. And this is the first ingredient I'm going to add now, which is apricots, six ounces. These are no-soak apricots, and they've just been cut in half, so they're nice and chunky when you eat them in the cake. This here is six ounces of pecan nuts, and the pecan nuts have been put in a medium oven for eight minutes and just lightly toasted. And then the next ingredient is six ounces of Bramley apple weighed after you've, you've peeled and chopped it. Nice and chunky again, because that um, makes the cake nice and moist. And then we're going to flavour it with some cinnamon. And I'm going to put in two slightly rounded teaspoons of cinnamon. There's the cinnamon. Now just fold that all in together. And then, as I said before, when you make uh, any cake at all, a sandwich cake or a sponge cake, as we made earlier, or a loaf cake, what you need is to always have exactly the right size tin for the mixture. And the tin I'm using in this case, because it's a loaf cake, is a classic two-pound loaf tin. And this is two pounds in weight, and it's been very, very lightly buttered. And now I'm just going to pour the mixture into it using my spatula here to get everything in. And then I'm just going to smooth it out on the top like that. Get it nice and smooth, and then it's going to have a topping on it. And the topping is going to be sugar and cinnamon. But I'm not just sprinkling sugar on. What I've got here, this is sugar lumps, and they're brown sugar lumps. And what I've done is I've crushed them coarsely with a quarter of a teaspoonful of cinnamon. 
And the reason I'm ju not just using sugar, but sugar lumps, is because you get sort of nice crunchy consistency on top of the cake. So we'll just sprinkle that now on top of the surface of the cake. And this is going to go into a preheated oven, gas mark four, that's a medium oven. And it will take between an hour and a quarter and an hour and a half to cook. Now, the very best way to tell if a cake is cooked is to just slide it out on the shelf and just give it a depression with your little finger like that. And if it springs back, then the cake is cooked. If it leaves an indentation, then you put it back in and give it another five minutes. Anyway, that one seems to be pretty well cooked, so we'll take it out. And leave it in the tin to cool for a few minutes, and then loosen it round the edges, turn it out, cool it on a wire rack. And we've got a cake here that has been um, cooled, so what I now want to do is just um, cut it in half, see that lovely crunchy topping, and just show you what it looks like inside. And there we have it, apricot and pecan loaf cake. Well, sadly, we've come to the end of our winter collection of recipes, but there is some good news as well, and that is the winter's now passing on, and summer's on its way, and we've all got that to look forward to. As for me, I've got to say goodbye, but thank you for coming and sharing my recipes with me in my home in Suffolk. All I've got to do now is go away and find some more exciting recipes for next time. Bye.